it seemed that I could have kept busy with all that Cree and Cree language and, and engagement with Cree community stuff. Um, and I did, but almost everything seemed to spread out into other things. Um, I got involved with a project with Barbara Burnaby, who was then at Saskatchewan New Start, to adapt Sesame Street for Cree kids. Nothing. They were trying to come up with a way to get some more funding, and they didn't. But I used the material in teaching for a long time. We built a cabin set at New Start, and all of their indigenous staff were going over there to have their coffee in the morning. And then we borrowed an elder who had been one of, in one of their programs, and he turned up in a suit. And yeah, then they borrowed seven kids from a boarding school. And he would say things, to the, Fred would say things to them. They made me write a script, which was ludicrous, but the things that happened were, were more interesting. Um, and he'd tell them something in Cree, and then he'd say, or, or sorry, he'd tell them something in English, which he was supposed to be doing. And then he said, now I'll tell you that story in Cree. You'll like it better, which they did. And I used to shock my students with the tapes so I could watch it and tell which language he was speaking. And it wasn't accent, because he had the same accent in English and in Cree. But there was a level of relaxation and, and responsiveness in the interaction that he had, both in his own um, small behavior and in the re kid's response to him that made it real clear. And so you get things like, here's a picture of a moose. Here's a number one. Here's a number payak one. And then Fred looks at these things. He's supposed to be talking about how you say this in Cree and how you say it in English. And he looks at the kids and he says, now, um, uh, what happens if I say payak moose? That's not right. Oh, how come? Well, you got to say payak moswa. Oh, then he points at the number one and he says, what language is that in? And the kids light up like they know the answer to this question. English. It's in English because you write the number one in school, not because, no, they don't have the idea that a written number in that sense is something that you would associate with the identification of one object in the world because you do that in another kind of way. Possibly had it been the word one, that wouldn't have happened, but certainly the number. And these were Cree dominant, uh, first language speakers of, of Cree. Okay, so um, Cree was not the only language spoken in Northern Alberta in the 70s and 80s. Um, my first marriage had broken up before I left Philadelphia, and I remarried um, a Slavic linguist, which is how I know so much about the teaching of Ukrainian at the University of Alberta. Um, it had been to that point not something I cared much about, but um, that was Anthony L. Vanek, who was a transformational grammar type, trained not at MIT, but by Bob Lease at Illinois. And so it was a kind of side shoot. Um, his fine moment was in his dissertation defense when he disagreed with one of Chomsky's rules. And a committee member said, surely you don't expect us to, or, or sorry, you expect us to change the grammar, the universal grammar on the basis of check. And he said, yes, simple answer. Um, and a good anthropologist's answer. He was an interesting character. We did a lot of the Cree field work together um, and had four children together. Um, we split up in 1982. Um, one of the first things that came out of that was that one of his students was from a Dukabor Russian community in southern British Columbia. And we decided to do some field work there. Again, there was this standard language approach that the Slavics department insisted upon. The work that we did in the Dukabor community, I got 
large merit increments for from the Department of Anthropology, and Toyuk was told that it wasn't a contribution to Slavic linguistics, so it didn't count as something he did. However, it was fascinating. We started out thinking that we would do a dialect atlas of the dialect of Dukabor Russian, and that was interesting for the few interviews he did um, with very elderly members of the community. What became much more interesting was the generational structure of the language maintenance within the community. There were a few elders whose, whose language reflected the, the Russian that came from, um, from Russia, uh, which is highly influenced by Ukrainian. And the next generation were um, certainly fluent speakers of Russian, but it was a somewhat different kind of Russian. And then as you, the community had for a very long time run a Russian school after school for Dukabor children. And that one was moving rapidly toward, the fellow who had started it was retiring and he spoke the local dialect that the grandparents living in a home would speak. And more of the children were not learning Russian at home by that point. So when this fellow retired, his teenage protégés began to teach the class. And there was a movement toward wanting to speak standard Russian because they were thinking about things like perhaps wanting to travel in the Soviet Union, um, like the Dukabor heritage in um, Russia. And it was really moving much, much more in some people's view toward something that, that would be a different kind of Russian and that ran into the same sorts of issues of um, standard and community spoken, a diglossia kind of situation, um, which mapped out very nicely onto a generational structure. And we wrote several papers jointly, Dunyik and I, on, um, on that Russian, which got us involved with some people who were doing um, who were doing work on languages in general. Um, this was the aftermath of the Royal Commission on Bilingualism and Biculturalism in the 60s. I, of course, was not part of that because I didn't go to Alberta until 69. But it was a big deal in Alberta still because of the other languages volume of that report, which was the response of, of many of my neighbors at that point was, how come we can't have Ukrainian on our cereal boxes? So there was a great deal of, shall we say, discussion as to the appropriateness of only two official languages, which was not well understood in the prairies, where German and, um, well, many, German and Ukrainian were the two largest immigrant languages, and then we had a good many speakers of both Cree and Blackfoot um, in the province, which also came in high on numbers and way above French. So it was a legitimate kind of thing that the Royal Commission addressed. The result of it, and I read it largely from the prairies because that was the... the um, the context in which I came to understand it at all. But what that produced was the multiculturalism policies of the 70s and 80s, in which we began to be able to talk about bilingualism and multiculturalism. We still can't talk about multilingualism. So if somebody who works for the feds comes in and says to me, I want to take your Cree course because I'm going to be dealing with lots of native people. And they're not going to be able to get the tuition paid, and possibly not the time off. Although we ran it in night school for many years just because more people could do that that needed to. Uh, if, he, if that person took French, that would be fine and they could do it easily. Um, so in that sense, multilingualism was just a no-fly. 
If you defined language as part of the maintenance of culture, however, you could continue to do things that I would call language revitalization, but we didn't call it that. So there was a huge multiculturalism push in Alberta um, in those years. Um, because I was working with the, the Dukabor Russian material, I managed to meet a lot of people across Canada who were interested in similar issues. We also, for a part of it, had a Ukrainian landlady who was absolutely fascinating. So it's sort of... What does an ordinary person with no particular education make out of this? And basically, oh, it's just fine on the surface, but you start pushing no appreciation whatsoever of multiculturalism, just of what it might do for Ukrainian or for me. And so we began to be interested in the, the places in which... <coughs> excuse me, the places in which... Um, Ukrainian might be used as opposed to English. At the same time, I was trying to teach language and culture to university students who wanted Canadian materials, and I couldn't find much. There was a great deal of material, of course, on, on French in Quebec, um, certainly, given the events of the 70s in Quebec. But that wasn't actually of much interest to my students. Most of the University of Alberta students were the first person in their family from somewhere outside Edmonton, but in Alberta, or perhaps as far afield as Battleford, Saskatchewan, which is practically at the border. Um, they just didn't want to hear about French or about languages in general. They wanted to know something that, that seemed to them more local. Now, one of the things that Tony did in that stretch was to edit a journal called Papers and Linguistics, uh, which we printed out of our basement. I'm probably one of the few people to have had a printing press in my pantry for some years, but anyway, it was entertaining. I learned a lot about printing, um, and it worked. It was the Linguistic Inquiry, the MIT journal, had a, a much narrower take than we felt was necessary on the nature of language. So I think it was an interesting alternative. Um, and until 1982, I was up to my eyeballs in, in that and in the contacts that it brought. One of the things we were able to do was to run a monograph series alongside. And I did, I edited three volumes on Canadian languages, which I still now they're, I suppose, rare books, but practically every university library in Canada has them. Um, language use in Canada. No, wait, wait. Linguistic diversity in Canadian society. Canadian languages in their social context. And, and the, fir the first title I gave you was the last one, right? Language use in Canada. Um, what they did was to say that we have artificially divided the question of language in Canada in a way that doesn't actually make sense. So each of those volumes had at least two papers on charter languages, that is English and French. And then we turned to immigrant languages, and we had some papers on those, language use rather than language structure kinds of things. And then we had some things on native languages. And because of the structure of, <coughs> of funding for research, for example, in Canada, they came under three different kinds of headings, and it was very difficult to try and structure any formal research that would look into the ways in which there were commonalities there. I think there's absolutely no question that people looking at native language material, for example, looked at... at to, um, at what was going on in Quebec to be able to understand how one might take various kinds of political positions. And that may have annoyed people in Quebec, but it was very useful out there in the prairies. Uh, distinct society and all. So there were just a lot of really interesting things on the ground that made it reasonable to talk about these things together. But it was very difficult to figure out a way to... Um, 
to bring them together. And I, I hope, certainly I found those collections useful for my own teaching because I could hang it on things that people had experience about. And I think it was, it was useful in terms of the whole multicultural argument to be able to make some kind of point that this isn't just about painting Ukrainian Easter eggs, but that there are a whole lot of larger predicaments of communities that retain a degree of discreteness within Canadian society or parts of it. I also tried to get the multicultural folks to support a project that we were going to look at some of the issues of, of multicultural language in two small cities in Alberta as opposed to Edmonton, Calgary. Now, most of the stuff, most of the multicultural comparative work is on large cities. And yet, much of what's going on is, is in a much more localized sort of context. In my field work in Culling Lake, Alberta, when I took everybody to the bar on Saturday night in my truck, <clears throat> um, that poor old truck had an interesting life. Uh, we'd go down to the bar and the people at the table would be speaking at least half a dozen languages. Now, English was, to the large part, a shared language. There would be Cree, there would be some French, because there were a couple people who spoke that. There was some German guy who came in from the Nutterite community. <laughs> they all thought that was a kick, because you'd buy him beer he wasn't supposed to drink, and he always walked out having to be carried to his truck. I've never asked how he got home. Um, <coughs> there was some Polish and Ukrainian. I did. I mean, it was just this this crazy kind of mix. And you get stuff like somebody playing a drum song on a guitar case. And, I, you know, it was just, they all sat around and shared their stories and their experiences. There was a black farming community just, Amber Valley, just outside of, um, um, of the service town, Athabasca. And so there were always a couple of these fellas from there, and they, of course, still had bits of the southern accent and bits of the old blues. If I knew more about music, I apparently would have gotten really excited about this stuff. Uh, the student who was working with that community, and I spent a lot of time with him because of his work, um, same guy that introduced me to Mary Rose and Clovis Cardinal. Um, he never did complete the degree, so the stuff was never published. And I've always regretted that because he had some very nice material, but it wasn't mine. Anyway, um, it was a, a kind of interaction. It's very different from Mrs. Kozlowski, who was my landlady in Edmonton, who almost never really had to deal with anyone in English. Okay, But you couldn't do that when the communities were so mixed. And I think that the whole multicultural boat missed this sort of ethnographic reality of the mixture and meetings um, of these groups. And that seemed to me to be a terribly important one. At least in the old Union Hotel bar, they were pretty egalitarian. Apparently all the people who wouldn't want that kind of mix went over to the veterans' post to do their drinking. I never did do that. Um, but we had a very different kind of mix. So I was trying to find some sort of perspective that would integrate all of these kinds of things and to think about the ways in which what I learned in one of those communities would apply also to the other ones. Um, and again, I, I found it really useful to have contacts with different communities to try and get out of this us and them as a binary rather than as a multiplicity, because it really is a multiplicity. And it's out of a whole bunch of other orders, but it seems to follow logistically um, that I also did field work in the 80s while I was still at Alberta, but after I left the children's father and before 
or sorry, and when I again got involved in some research because of a partner, um, I remarried Dr. George Ozerai, who was a uh, hydrogeologist, Hungarian, very Hungarian. He spoke many languages in Hungarian, um, sort of like Roman Jakobson, famously. Um, and he was working, for, he took a job three months after we were married with the UNDP in the Gambia, West Africa. And so the children and I spent three, three months summers in the Gambia, where I was not doing field work, but of course anthropologists can't not do field work. I always checked one suitcase of clothing and had the children lug my books and papers um, we were something else getting off the plane, both coming and going, but there you are. Um, they were five, seven, nine, and 11 that first summer, and it was earth-shakingly um, life-changing for, I think, all of them in various ways. I think we were an adventure not to be repeated, if you can help it, for the expatriate community in Banjul also. Um, <coughs> we had a tendency to hang out with local folks, the children particularly, that did not go over well. Um, and I didn't, I only wrote one paper as a result of that experience, and it was about an expedition of the UNDP staff upriver to investigate the Gambia River. It, the Gambia is the British water rights in the old days, in the middle of Senegal, encompassed on all sides. So we were all going to go up to investigate the complaint of a community that a windmill blade had fallen off and killed three donkeys. So I wrote this paper about the saga of the three donkeys. So we've got a whole car full of of people, none of whom speak the local language except our Mandinka driver who does not speak the technicalities of windmills and windmill blades. Okay, so off we go. And it was just fiasco from one end to the other. And I came back and wrote a description of it somewhat later because after I came back there was an African Studies Conference in Edmonton and I thought, well, you know. I've had the department convinced I'm sort of doing field work, so I would give this paper about the three donkeys, and which I still like. It was published in a completely invisible um, collection of selected papers from that conference. I've never found it in a library, and I don't have a copy of the published version. Uh, but I do have the text <coughs> and retyped it on a computer because I wanted to use it for, te for teaching eventually. Um, but the thing about the African Studies Conference was that all the African students on campus had come to this conference, and they were all cackling and rolling in the aisles. So I think I got it right, and that made me feel really good. Some of my academic colleagues were looking at me like I'd lost my mind. Um, but again, you're talking about this, this institutional thing that comes down from the UN, from the, UN, from the UNDP, that has really limited intersection with anything that's going on on the ground. And you, you simply can't seem to persuade them that the object was to drill wells, not to whatever. Anyway, um, the projects are often absolute disasters and probably should be because they're not doing anything that's much help. In principle, you're training personnel for a counterpart personnel that's going to be capacity building, but in practice, it very rarely works out that way. And again, I think an anthropologist on staff would be, or someone with comparable skills, would be extremely useful for that kind of project. George tried, but they really weren't interested, um, which is too bad. But we ended up with with the kids having a really strong experience of what it was like to, to live there. And I discovered that they were colorblind. Well, I you know, didn't occur to them that there ought to be a problem. Um, so for them, there wasn't. But it was a very 
racially segregated community from the point of view. They had a lot of friends who hung out at the local swimming pool, for example, as opposed to the beach, which I far preferred. But anyway, they used to go. So they'd take the two gardener's kids with them also when they went. And they got kicked out one day because somebody decided to complain about the two black kids in the hotel swimming pool. And my oldest son got out of the pool, goes, all six of them start traipsing down the road, dust road, they're maybe five miles from home. Noonday sun in the tropics. They got not far enough for anyone to start complaining yet. My four go in steps and then the gardeners two go down two more steps. So they're trudging down the road, and a taxi comes barreling up behind them. I give you a ride home. Trey says, we don't have any money. That's OK. I take you home. Then, so they all, all six of them pile in the car. Trace tries to give him directions for how to get to our house. He says, I know where you live. OK. So the kids come in. We got a free ride home. Oh, no, you didn't, dear. George had just walked in the door, hadn't gotten his coat off before the taxi cab driver comes barreling back in to get paid. But everybody knew us. Everybody took care of the kids because they knew everybody. They, they just sort of were who they were. And it was a really nice way for, for all of us to experience a different world. I sent my colleague from grad school, Judy Irvin, who worked with the Wolof in Senegal, um, a postcard that first summer saying, Judy, these people are not American Indians, which she apparently, a love right now, which she apparently thought was hilariously funny. I did too. It was just because the etiquette is so absolutely reverse of the one that I had been trying to internalize from the Cree for so many years. You have to stare at people and yap incessantly to be polite. And I found that it didn't give me the chance to think and to analyze and to respond. I didn't enjoy it as, I enjoyed the experience. But I don't think I could have done serious field work that way.